I have to say a thank you to Rob for this music because I'm about ready to start bel belting Helen Ready right now, but I'm going to restrain myself. So welcome to this panel uh, entitled Other People's Money, Governance, Integrity, and Ethics. My name is Rana Faruhar. I'm an AME and columnist at Time in charge of economics and business and an analyst at CNN. Very pleased to be here moderating this panel, particularly following that amazing conversation from uh, Chair Yellen and Christine Lagarde. That was really incredible. So this is a very broad panel. We've got about 75 minutes, so we have a lot of time to discuss the issue. And, and the, the key thing that we're going to try and get at is that we have a number of individuals in public institutions, in companies, that are basically responsible for your money. And how do we ensure that they protect your trust? How do we ensure that uh, vested interests don't take uh, priority over average Americans, average people around the world? So that's what we're going to be discussing today. And I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. We're going to speak amongst ourselves for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to open it up for questions, um, which I'm sure we'll have a, a lot of from the very smart folks here. Um, so directly to my left here is Nayari Woods, who's the dean of the Blavatnik School of Government and Professor of Global Economic Governance at Oxford. She developed that school over the last three years. Welcome. To her left, Commissioner Kara Stein, Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm sure many of you know her. And finally, on the far left, Margaret Heffernan, who's a businesswoman and author of Willful Blindness, uh, which is a terrific book, actually, and we're going to be giving away some free copies, so as you leave, please take one. And also, Anad Ahmadi's book, uh, The Banker's New Clothes, will be outside as well, so make sure to pick some up as you leave. Okay. So, Commissioner, I want to start with you. Um, Chair Yellen and Christine Lagarde gave us sort of an overview, you know, historical overview of where we've come since the crisis. Um, and talked a little bit about where regulation has gone. This is something that you care deeply about, have been very vocal about. Give us your sort of 35,000 foot beyond Dodd-Frank. Where are we? What's working? You've said in speeches that you think that um, uh, things are a mixed bag at the moment and that that's putting it charitably. So deconstruct that a bit for us. Well, I probably have to start with Dodd-Frank, despite mm. uh, what you just said. I, I think we still have a lot to get done. And I, I also have to make a disclaimer as a SEC commissioner that the views I'm expressing today are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the <laughs> staff or of the commission. So get that out of the way. We still have a lot to do. Dodd-Frank uh, was uh, passed in 2010 and we're not done. We haven't finished our swaps regulation. We haven't finished executive compensation. We haven't fixed some uh, basic uh, issues on the securitization front and being able to bet against the securitization that you created. So I think we still need to get that done and see how that's going. So part of the mixed bag is we're not done yet. I think one of the other things we all need to be thinking about, especially in the, uh, in the financial marketplace, is it's really run by computers now. Mm. So we're in a completely different world than we were even five to 10 years ago. And to some degree, it's a global marketplace with computers trading with one another or interacting with one another, and our market is being disrupted by the innovation. The old institutions are being disrupted by the innovation, and we are too, as regulators. So I think one of the projects at hand is having enough uh, space for these emerging issues on the agenda. I've suggested uh, at our own agency, or at the commission, that we have a, a chief, basically data officer, uh, we have a consolidated audit trail that we've been working on that's not done yet that would enable us to figure out what happens on, uh, like what happened in the flash crash now. Uh, we would be able to figure that out more quickly than three months you know, after the fact. So I think there's a, it's a mixed bag because we have a lot to do and then we have a whole new set of emerging issues that we need to be focused on. Can, I'm just gonna ask you one follow-up question. Can, can, right, there's, there's a line of thinking that regulation can basically never keep up with the speed of data, with the speed of innovation within financial institutions. What would you say to that? Um, that's probably true. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I think we should set up the regulation to take that into account, right? So to some degree, and, and people have touched on this uh, before, we need to better align the incentives of the to be helping 
regulators. Uh, so a lot of that has to do with transparency. So we're a disclosure agency for the most part. To the degree we can allow investors, investment professionals to look at data and make decisions about what's happening in the marketplace, have that data available to academics so they can help us as well. I think we need to, to do as much as we can to provide that data to those who are interested in it to help regulators better regulate. Some of what you're touching on gets into the culture arena. So, Margaret, I want to come over to you because this is your area, and willful blindness had so many great anecdotes, not just in the financial sector, but across corporate America about the way in which culture influences behavior. Um, and I, I think that you believe as well that culture is much more important in some ways than regulation to the, the discussion about governance. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think regulation is really important. I don't think anybody in here is really seriously going to argue with that. But the risk is in the people. And the people are managed by managers, or as they're fashionably called now, leaders. And it's interesting to me that if you look at the banks today, they're generally being run in the same way by the same kinds of people, if not exactly the same people, as they were pre-2008, 2007. They're coming out of pretty much the same educational traditions, pretty much the same social traditions, they're being assessed and overseen in pretty much the same ways. And strangely enough, we're expecting a different outcome. <laughs> and uh, this won't work. Mm. And it's, you know, what's really interesting when I talk to CEOs is that they have a sense that culture is this amorphous thing out there that they can't impact. And if you talk to their workforce, they have this sense that culture is this amorphous thing they can't impact. So everybody gives what you know what's called the General Motors salute, which is you point that way, in terms of who's responsible. So I think there is a huge amount of really serious work to be done about what are the structures that encourage the ethical behavior that everybody talks about. What do we do about the fact that very steep hierarchies are correlated with higher degrees of corruption? So how can we create institutions that are flat enough and small enough to reduce that risk? How do we think about the vast body of academic work that shows that the more people think about money, the less they think about each other? And think about compensation not just as something that's on the balance sheet, but something that's in people's heads that governs how they behave. And I think you know, regulation hasn't begun to touch that. My observation, because I do work with a number of the world's leading banks, is that everybody's still pretty traumatized. Um, it's certainly in the UK where there's a very clear awareness now that they can all go to jail. There's a real um, nervousness about do I want to be in this industry? I think the good thing is the people who have that conversation with themselves and decide yes, maybe in a different state of mind than their predecessors. But I think there's a real failure to recognize that these big complex institutions cannot be run by heroic supermen or even superwomen. You know, that the complexity, the scale, the importance, the scope of them is so huge that we need a very different leadership model with different kinds of people with a different mindset from different educational institutions and overseen by people who have an understanding of how that human complexity plays out. And I don't today see any of that. Is there an, another industry that's gotten this right and, ha and has that model that finance could take lessons from? There's one, because you know, I've been looking, trust me, mm -hmm. I've been looking, because you know, willful blindness is endemic and it's human nature. So I'm very obsessed with how do we mitigate it. And the one industry I've seen that's done this in a really compelling way is the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. So in 1972, there was a horrible plane crash just outside of London, mm -hmm. everybody died. Uh, and it became clear in the subsequent investigation that lots of people had known about all the causes that led up to that crash. In exactly the same way, lots of people knew about the risks that the banks were carrying. So the issue isn't this stuff's invisible or it's some kind of black swan, right? It's, you know, I've never seen a black swan. I'm not sure any of us have. Um, so the, it, the problem with these failures is everybody knows. Everybody knows, everybody, you know, lots and lots of people can see them coming. So the aviation industry devised something that they called just culture. 
And just culture operates on the assumption that everybody comes into work to do a good job. And it is everybody's responsibility to look after safety. So everyone from the cleaner to the CEO, if they see anything that gives them pause, has an obligation to say something. So if a cleaner sees a dripping tap, they have to say, there's a tap dripping, is that OK? And what's really interesting about this, and there are, you know, there's a complex series of procedures of hurdles, but when it was first introduced, they got 4,000 reports across the whole industry. Last year, they got 14,000. So it is working. People are using it. It is safe to speak up. It's not safe not to speak up. And it's generally credited with having made aviation the single safest form of transport. There was an understanding, and I think this is really fundamental to our theme, that what the airlines did not want to compete on was safety, mm. and that they had to share data and insights across the board, because while they might compete on everything, they didn't compete on that. And what I think is so inspiring about this as a model is this is a global, disaggregated, highly complex mm. industry running on razor-thin margins. Mm. And if they can pull it off, the financial industry should be able to pull it off. But it requires that you want to know what's going on. That's really interesting. Um, OK, Nairi, I'm going to come to you. As the academic on the panel, you've studied you know, both of these areas, the intersection of regulation and culture. Um, when lawmakers in this country and in other countries are under so much pressure mm -hmm. from industry lobby, um, and there's so much cognitive capture. How can they fight back against that? I mean, where do you see the openings where progress can be made? Yeah, I think, and, and you're right, that my interest as a sort of dean of a school of government is very much in, in what, how can we help governments to do better? Um, I completely agree with both my fellow panelists that culture is really important. But equally, the job of the regulators and the job of the legislators is really important. Um, and on culture, I think it is disappointing that the heads of banks have not done a bigger leap in setting implementable culture changes, not just sort of large statements of their own personal sort of ethics. But, but coming to what governments can do, what's so striking, as we walked in here, uh, somebody said to Cara, C Commissioner Stein, I should say, that she's doing God's work. And, um, um, and what they're capturing there, and the first thing I want to say about what we need to do is the extraordinary um, obstacles that legislators and regulators are facing. So in a big study of uh, the politics of global regulation, a colleague of, of mine and I sort of tracked where regulation succeeds and where it doesn't across different sectors. What One of the clear overall findings is that all... Although people focus on the legislative moment, the passing of Dodd-Frank, the passing of new banking regulation in, in the European Union, and they look at campaign financing donations and all the pressures that come to bear on that moment of legislation, that's not actually where capture tends to happen. It happens after that, in the implementation, in the monitoring, the reporting, and the enforcement. And these things are occurring outside of the spotlight of public opprobrium and public you know, interest and, and public outrage at, at bailout money. And yet that's where it happens. And that's an important finding because a lot of the regulation that has been announced since 2008 has been announced with a start date, which is way down the road, 2019. You know, and, and that period down the road is a period when the spotlight of public attention continues to diminish and therefore the likelihood of the process becoming captured and distorted by those who stand to make the most from a laxer regulation is likely to increase. So what is it that, that, that makes the regulatory process in those phases so difficult? Three kinds of asymmetry or three real inequalities. The first is an obvious one of incentives. The incentive, the material incentive at stake, the profit at stake for somebody to play fast and loose with the rules, and the public status, money, and um, approval that comes with that or has come with that in the past so far outweighs the incentives for the regulator 
to actually regulate and face opprobrium and be called stupid and not understanding the system and anti-private sector and anti-innovation and anti, um, you know, all, all things good. So, so the role of the regulator starts with this great asymmetry of incentives. What are the incentives if you're a regulator to really do your job to the nth, as opposed to the plaudits, the support, the future job offers that you get by playing your job with a light touch? And we saw that prior to the crisis. The second is a real asymmetry of information, right? It's impossible for regulators to be playing catch up with so little in information, so little accessible information, and a third asymmetry is around resources, so little staffing and resources to play that catch up. People have documented how many regulators and the salaries of regulators in the United States compared to those who are working in the private financial sector. In a meeting I hosted in Oxford at the end of 2009 when the European Banking Authority had come into play, um, the, one of the banks there I asked, you know, how many people are working on public sector relations in your bank? 200 was the answer. And I turned to Andrea Enria, who was the head of the European Banking um, Authority, and said, and how many people do you have on your full-time staff? Have a guess. The number was six, okay? And then there were some secondments on top of that. This is, a, this is an extraordinarily unequal game. So how on earth, even with the perfect regulation, how on earth can we expect regulators in this sector to do the job? So three ideas about how we can deal with that. So the first is, think about the design of regulation. The more we put an onus on regulators themselves to be informed, to be up with the latest innovation, to be up with the latest trend, to be light touch, the less likely regulation will ever, ever succeed. Regulation to succeed when, when there's this huge asymmetry has to be utterly simple. You know, an example you might take from international marine regulation, where to stop tankers discharging toxic waste at sea, for years the, the industry succeeded in persuading regulators that they should only be fined when they were caught dumping at sea. Of course, it's impossible to catch people dumping at sea. You'd have to patrol all, all the oceans of the sea, and then when you do find toxic waste, you've got to prove that it was that ship and not another ship. So it was a regime that didn't work. The alternative was costly for the industry. It was double hull tanks. Because why? Because then you just need one regulator showing up in port and asking one simple question. Do you have the equipment? or do you not have the equipment? You don't have the equipment, we impound you, we fine you. So think about what that means for financial regulation. How do we design regulation that makes it possible for a very small number of poorly resourced and ill-informed regulators to actually do their job? Okay, that's important. Go ahead, were you gonna make a Well, just, point? just the, the other, I think the other two things that, that we need to think about are how we design institutions. So ensuring institutions <coughs> are open as Commissioner Stein pointed out, um, that's really important. And ensuring that we empower pub public watchdogs and, and holders of the public interest to really oversee that process. So in Britain, there's been two. There's been the Independent Commission on Banking, led by my Oxford colleague, John Vickers. And there's been the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards in which the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was mentioned earlier today, Justin Welby, has played a significant role. And these commissions have done a great job in tracking the slow progress. The, independent, the Parliamentary Commissions produced a great little paper which details the places where, frankly, the politicians began seriously to drag their feet and where the commissioners had to get into the public spotlight get into the committee rooms, use their positions in Parliament and in the House of Lords, and really hold the legislators' feet to the fire and say, no, you know, you can't go wobbly now. You know, you've got to follow this through and, and legislate in these ways. They did not win all, but I think it just shows that when we think about the institutions, we need to shine a public spotlight on them. Just one last little story, and then I'll, I'll mm. be quiet. There is, there is a thought that if we're too transparent, we open our institutions of regulation to the very people that we don't want capturing the process. And I, I would challenge that. Um, back in 2009, I remember deciding to try an experiment. I thought I would call the um, 
BIS and ask when the next Basel committee was meeting. And I was told this was not publicly available information. I was not permitted to know when the next Basel committee meeting was. Um, and I probed and questioned and, and just as a member of the public wanting to know when this next meeting to discuss regulation would occur. <coughs> and then coming to a dead end, I called a friend working in one of the major banks who used to work for government, now works for a major bank, and said, do you know when the next Basel committee meeting is? And he said, oh, let me look at the agenda. Uh, yeah, it's such and such a date. Okay, so, so who is this <laughs> secrecy actually protecting? What, I think with the best intent in the world, we can try to closet our regulators away from the public. But in the end, the sunshine, you know, the sunshine effect of transparency is the more important one. We just have to back that up with holders of the public interest who really are watchdogs. We can't simply rely on the press and on the kind of general public who on the whole don't wake up thinking, I wonder what the Basel committee's decided today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. That's a great, yeah, fantastic point. Um, Commissioner Stein, I just, I'd like you to weigh in and, and respond to some of that. And in particular, this need for some more simplicity in regulation, would that make your job a lot easier? And also, you know, who, who should be these watchdogs or guardians here in the US, do you think? Um, no, I, 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 that rings true to me as well. I think sometimes with regulation, and again, with not enough resources, not enough staff, simple is better. And you have a sort of bright, brighter line. Everybody knows what the rule is, and it's easier to enforce. Um, so that rings true to me. Um, I'm a big believer in open and transparent institutions, and I already said that. I think, uh, you know, again, it's the old sunshine is the best disinfectant, mm -hmm. and I think all of our institutions benefit from that. We have, uh, you know, something I've been thinking a lot of, about at the commission. We have the Sunshine Act that requires us to notify people when we're meeting to talk about policy. And also, we have, we have open and closed meetings. So we have open meetings, which tend to be our rulemaking meetings. We have closed meetings, which are our enforcement proceedings. So I see about 12 cases a week where I vote on how we're going to proceed on an enforcement case. And we basically say uh, the Sunshine Act will not apply to those meetings which was interesting coming from working in the Senate, where actually most meetings are public. But it's been interesting to me to see what happens because basically more than two commissioners can't meet at any one time in any setting to talk about anything because of the Sunshine Act. So it also has had this strange impact on being able to talk to your colleagues and actually try to get to yes. Right, because you're actually negotiating through your staff. Mm. Your staff can meet. All five commissioners' staff can meet in a room without any public transparency mm. and talk about whatever the issue at hand is, but the commissioners themselves can't. So when I think about transparency, you have to think through some of these unintended consequences of trying to sunlight on the process and what's happening as a result of that. Um, and I keep you know, trying to think through that in our commission structures. And then empowering watchdogs is incredibly important, but I think it gets back to having the data out there and having the transparency. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in the United States, we have the Administrative Procedures Act. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly important that people weigh in on notice and comment uh, rulemaking. Mm -hmm. And the people who are weighing in usually are pretty sophisticated and hire fantastic attorneys <laughs> and have a lot of money at stake. Mm. And we don't necessarily hear from the investor community, you know, or, or, or people who might be on the other side of the issue. So as a regulator, it's figuring out, you know, making sure academics are weighing in and, and, and participating in the government process and not writing an article Right, that might or might not be read, you know, as you go through that notice and comment process. So I th think part of even having the conference today is how to have media, 
academics, people in the public sector, people who have been thinking long and deeply about these issues and having us think about them and then weigh in at the right time. Mm. And what I often say to people, we're a democracy here in the United States and we're only as good as the people who participate in it. Mm. So getting people to weigh in as we go through Dodd-Frank rulemakings, mm. you know, for example, and giving us uh, different perspectives to break up the group think you know, so, that you're talking about. So this is touching on, you know, you, both of you have touched in different ways on the need to get um, a, di a broader and more diverse variety of stakeholders basically involved in the process, get people um, in, in the general public sort of weighing in on this stuff. What I hear from a lot of people is the complexity, the complexity of the process, the complexity of the language that people use to talk about these issues is still a big deal. And that skews the debate in all sorts of ways. I mean, for starters, it means that whatever is simplest to say, whether it's correct or not, or the most meaningful point or not, is what gets attention. Um, how do we get beyond that? Margaret, you're somebody who deals with this sort of stuff all the time. Yeah, well, I, th I mean, I think it's interesting because what concerns me about the discussion is that we're talking about the financial world and regulators over here at a conference called Finance and Society. So finance and regulators are over here. Somewhere over there is society. <laughs> And there's this kind of big chasm between the two of them. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about this morning, um, hearing Janet Yellen speak, was how fantastic to have somebody running the Fed who speaks in a way that most people can understand. You know, that it's great that opacity and um, you know, kind of oblique mumbo jumbo has been laid to rest for at least a while. But I, you know. <laughs> But I think one of the important aspects of transparency is that it forces institution, re institutions, regulators and banks to explain themselves in ways that people can understand. Because undoubtedly, one reason banks got away with mayhem was they would spout a lot of gobbledygook. Everybody would think, oh, it's too complicated for me, and fundamentally abdicate their responsibility. And that happened in the media as well as um, in general you know, public discourse. So I think one important aspect of transparency is it forces a more lucid form of communication, mm. which is you know, really critical. But I think we still have in bank cultures, and I've probably worked with all of the major banks, a real ambivalence about what they're there for. Mm. Are they there? for shareholders, because that's what they were told for a long time in a grotesque oversimplification of what the law says. Are they there for themselves? Well, as human beings, they always will be up to a point. But what is their social responsibility? Are they, to some degree, a public utility? Because society requires that it functions. And what alarms me is that that's a kind of afterthought still that there is very little ethos in any of the banks that we are here to serve society. Mm. I would say that's still a big debate in all the major banks. Yeah. Who are we here for? And shareholder value is the ultimate alibi. I would like to do the right thing, but my shareholders won't let me. Mm. Well, OK, so that's a fascinating point. Actually, that reflects what uh, Christine Lagarde was saying this morning about banking being boring shouldn't be a a bad thing. I mean, banking serving the real economy should be an exciting thing. It should be about investigating real businesses, finding out where innovation is, funneling capital there. What are the levers, both from a regulatory standpoint and a cultural standpoint, that we can pull to help sort of make that ideological shift? Nairi, do you have any, or anybody want to weigh in on this? I guess there's, 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 there's two parts to that. There are the things that we need banks to do in the economy, and then there are financial activities that people like to engage in and that we might not want to forbid. Gambling, betting, investing in different ways. Um, and the governance problem that we got to was, I think, in some ways a fairly simple one, which is that we let over time what were private banks and private investment banks snuggle under um, the protection of the taxpayer by becoming publicly listed companies. And the history of that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I think there was a 
a British case which, which first brought banking under the British umbrella because the alternative was for you know, fine young men of the establishment to be rendered homeless when their banks failed. And all the other gentlemen in the club kind of rallied and said, well, this won't do. You know, with these, these, these bankers need protection. And you saw a diff, you know, th that was one step. But then the next step, to permit large investment banks to shed their private status and to become publicly listed companies. In other words, to invest as much as they like against, with absolutely limited liability, is madness. I mean, as any system of incentive, that is completely mad. Um, and so I think that those, those governance aspects, we really do need to think through, and that's what's being, that's what Britain is striving at with the idea of ring fencing. It's what the attempt to reinstate some form of Glass-Steagall is trying to do in the United States. And I think that's a, that goes to really core incentives for, for the behavior of people. We know that when people's private um, wealth is on the line, when they, are, when they face unlimited liability, they behave differently. Just look at the existing private banks in the world with unlimited liability, and look how much capital they hold. It's far higher than 9%, which is now the new Basel standard. It goes up to 16 or 17% in some parts of the world. So I think we, we've got to get those basic sort of governance structures right. And I think the public, you were saying the public need to be engaged, and the public does need to be engaged because, and to keep asking questions, not because we can expect every member of the public to understand every technicality of banking regulation. But what we permitted to happen by 2007 was that most of the members of the boards of most of the major banks could not explain their own institution's bank sheet mm -hmm. to you mm. or to their non-executive directors or to other organizations. Yeah. So we, we, we just slipped far too far in that direction. Yeah. Mm. No, Margaret, you're nodding. Yeah, well, I mean, m many of the chief executives couldn't explain it either, which is, you know, really startling. Um, and neither would they accept increased uh, visibility into their own risk when offered it by their own people. So, you know, I mean, that's willful blindness in a very spectacularly deliberate way. Yes, I could measure my risk better, but it would be too upsetting, so I'd really rather not, which is what <laughs> happened. You know, which is exactly what happened at Bear Stearns. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also important that we recognize that banking as we're talking about it, which is a kind of old-fashioned banking, right, it's big, big banks, is also changing in the sense that we have a lot of new entrants who are coming into niche banking and boutique banking and all kinds of funky new kinds of banking. And if we don't think the old banks have any kind of public service mentality, boy, oh boy, do these young young entrants not have mm. it either. Mm. And I think if you couple the potential impact of financial institutions with some of the breathtaking arrogance and um, kind of isolation of Silicon Valley, mm. you have a really interesting distant thunder. Yeah, well, right. So you're getting at um, stories like the idea that Apple, let's just take as an example, can um, you know borrow at the very low interest rates that we have because we had a financial crisis, uh, leave money in offshore tax havens, buy back stock, you know, on and on and on. That's an incredibly complicated mix involving many different kinds of public institutions, organizations. I mean, it gets really to the underlying ideology of what are companies there for? Right. Are they there to enrich shareholders? Are they there to enrich society? Right. And that's the same question we're asking about banks. So, um, and, at, and at what point does a company like Apple, which has such a gigantic hedge fund, become a financial institution? Right, right. Is it a financial company or is it a technology company? It's a really hard <laughs> question to answer. We need a whole other conference on that, but um, <laughs> or a session at least. But Commissioner, you know, there's an incredibly complex issue that goes way beyond the technicalities of this or that particular banking regulation. How do, how do you think about that? No, I, I think that goes back to what I was saying earlier about disruption. Mm. Alibaba is another you know, good example. So you have companies that cut across every regulatory silo. Are they a telecommunications company? Mm -hmm. Are they a financial firm? Mm. Are they uh, 
you know, they're doing peer-to-peer -peer lending, you know, are they, they're eBay, they're, they're everything. They're Amazon, eBay, banking committee, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Who's regulating them? Mm. And how do you regulate them? And how does an old school bank compete with something that now has, arguably should have about seven regulators mm. and might not have that many, you know, if at all? So I think uh, this goes back to the regulatory paradigms being disrupted. Yeah. The industry is being disrupted, and it's not just because of the you know, financial crisis. Right. And so I think it, it's an opportunity for us to reimagine you know, regulation. As it was being pointed out this morning, there's an opportunity here. But I think we've uh, re really got to be uh, thinking outside the box ourselves going forward. I was thinking when she was talking about yeah. the old uh, private investment firms, they regulated themselves to some degree. Because if your partner went out and was making too many risky choices, you might cut them out of the partnership at some point. So I think, again, we need to think about realigning incentives. Mm. You know, and it might be, uh, you know, and thinking through public companies, et cetera. But we need to think through the very powerful economic incentives that exist in a capitalist mm. system and think about when we regulate, when we um, you know, have certain people within a company be gatekeepers, you know, mm -hmm. what their responsibilities are gonna be and making them clear, you um, know, I think is helpful. Before we move on, and I wanna speak a little bit more about international be best practice and in, in, in all this. Um, Commissioner, you've been very concerned about making individuals and companies, banks more accountable. Speak, speak to, uh, to the waiver issue. You've really you know, been out there on this. Um, it's been a controversial one. Tell us your thinking. Well, I think it goes back to transparency and accountability again. Uh, when I first got to the commission, it wasn't clear to me how these decisions <laughs> were being made. We have to go to people who don't know. We have something called bad actor provisions in some of our statutes and some of our rules. And basically, if you commit criminal fraud, other bad acts, criminal in particular, but also some civil acts, you automatically are disqualified from being able to participate in, it could be a hedge fund money raising, it could be having a um, uh, sort of a streamlined process for issuing your own securities with less SEC oversight. And I was faced with uh, looking at a case myself and trying to decide uh, whether a waiver should be granted. And it wasn't clear to me at all what the uh, actual considerations that were being in, taken into account to make the decision. And the staff was largely making these decisions. So I sort of asked for guidelines. Mm. <laughs> and that's sort of what started this whole process. There really weren't guidelines for most of these waivers. And trying to make sure our process was consistent, fair, transparent, up on our website. Uh, I think the second part of it for me was that there seemed to be uh, a disproportionate number of waivers given to larger firms. So there was a sense that this was a rogue part of the firm that went off and did these bad actions, so you shouldn't make the rest of the very large global, perhaps, firm suffer because of the bad acts of the 30 rogue, you know, traders in some part of the firm. I was like, that might be true. Sometimes this is cabined off, but you should actually be looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis based on these facts. Was this the 44th time that the firm had had a problem like this? <laughs> Or was this the first? You know, had the firm had problems with LIBOR auction rate securities? You know, yeah. you go through the list. Is there a larger cultural, you know, issue? And has have the other waivers we've granted them in the past helped? So the other part of this for me was maybe we should have timeout waivers, conditional waivers. You might have uh, certain conditions attached to getting the waiver that might help the firm actually move towards better compliance. Mm. In effect, you have teeth mm. to say, you can get the waiver for this period of time, and then you need to come back and show 
the commission that you've accomplished these three objectives. So to some degree, it's thinking outside the box again with existing tools that the commission had, which actually might have more deterrent value at the end of the day than a large penalty. Mm -hmm. Large penalty sometimes for a large firm is sort of a speed bump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, what can you do to hold individuals to count, make sure uh, the firm is taking compliance or whatever the issue is seriously. So where do we stand with the waiver? I mean, how, you know, can you still uh, have 44 instances of malfeasance and still get a waiver? Um, have you been reading my dissents lately? <laughs> no, I think you know. I'm. I'm. I, I think again. I'll go back. I think this should be uh, uh, facts. We should look at each waiver individually. It should be based on the facts at hand. It should not be seen as an automatic waiver. Mm. It's an automatic disqualification, mm. and you have to show good cause for the commission granting you a waiver. And I, I think for me, it's about having this process be open, transparent. Mm. People can see whether it was a you know fair process or not. But that's what I would hope for. Yeah, um, Nairi, are other countries doing this any better? Are there? Any, you've given us a couple of lessons from the UK, but are there mm -hmm. other instances of international best practices that we should be thinking about here? I think um, all countries with. Um, large financial services sectors are really struggling. Mm. And they're struggling because the toxic combination of trying to clean up after the crisis caused by the banking sector, desperately needing growth, governments facing a need to contract their budgets and austerity, and suddenly there's a desire to see the financial services sector again as the golden goose that lays the golden egg. So when the financial services sector turns around and says, yes, we know there was that unfortunate accident in 2008, but you need us to be every bit as successful as we were in 2007 because that's going to be a driver for growth. Mm. Really difficult for other governments. I, I actually wanted on this sort of comparisons to ask Commissioner Stein about, so seen from the outside, you know, you look into New York and you see this extraordinary sort of panoply of different regulators and, and how does that work? I mean, it looks sometimes as though all these different regulators are tripping over the, each other, competing with each other, competing for, and that the, that the, sometimes that the private sector can play the regulators off a little bit, one against the other, and, and that sometimes they, cases and issues simply fall through the cracks, mm. with each regulator saying, I didn't realize that was in my basket. Is, but is that... Is that what it feels like? Or I don't think it feels that way. I think we... If you were offering best practice to other countries, would you offer this multi-regulator model? Mm. You should be moderating. This goes back to <laughs> having, <laughs> having 50 states, right? Um, it's the world we live in. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, coordination and cooperation between regulators is critical, both uh, within our own country and, uh, and across international jurisdictions. Like one of the lessons for me in 2008 was how interconnected our financial systems are. So you can no longer regulate just uh, what's happening within the borders of your own country. Now you need to be very aware, in your case, of what's happening in London. Um, and what's happening in Singapore and what's happening in Hong Kong and you know, can go through Sydney, Tokyo. So I think multilateral organizations, in my case like IOSCO, become increasingly important in our ability to talk to one another, sort of cut across some of these regulatory silos. Many of us here are repeat players with one another, so we do coordinate on enforcement cases there is more coordination going on than might be apparent, um, and sometimes there's not. So I think that's fair, you know, as well. But I, I do th think the financial crisis put into stark relief how important that type of cooperation is going to be going forward. Um, did you want to say? Well, I, I, you know, back to your question. Yeah. Sorry, I detoured us. No, I was no, dying no, to ask Commissioner Stein, but um, I think there are a couple of. Um, 
things at the international level that um, continue to need great attention. So one was an issue that Elizabeth Warren mentioned last night, which is that the impact of new investment treaties and the, the big TTIP and TTP on the capacity of governments to regulate. And we live in a world of silos where trade officials negotiate trade and investment treaties and finance officials negotiate financial regulation. And, and I think that puts at great risk the overlaps in that, and that it is already the case that bilateral investment treaties using these open-ended clauses are being used to quite severely limit, it, both through a, a, a dampening effect, even when cases are not brought by private investors, but also for when cases are brought to arbitration. And I think that nexus is, you know, I know I'm speaking to a group of people who research and work on the financial services side of things, I would really urge much more attention to the impacts of these open clauses in investment treaties. They need closing. Um, it's not to say we need to ban investment treaties, but we need to really close off the capacity of the financial services sector to use those investment treaties so that private actors can take governments into ICSID or into arbitration um, panels and limit their capacity to regulate, given how difficult We've already spoken about how difficult regulation actually is. And the other issue, I think, at the international that's a very interesting one that the 2008 crisis revealed is that at the global level, regulation has been taken forward, had been taken forward by a group of countries, all of whom had very large open financial services sectors, like Britain and the United States. And therefore, they had a, a shared, powerful interest in ensuring at the global level that the sort of maximal market opening and maximal deregulation took place. Those who bore the cost of the crisis without having borne the benefits of the great boon in the financial services sector were, of course, mm -hmm. countries that yeah, hadn't been winning on the financial services boom, but now suffered a great loss when the world economy seized up because of the financial services sector collapse. And I think opening up the table, I think the work the financial service, the FSB have done under Mark Carney's chairmanship has been terrific in opening that process up and ensuring there are other voices at the table. And it's not just token, let's have everybody represented. It actually goes to the core of ensuring that different stakes and different risks are represented at that table. But I think more work now needs to be done. It can't be a sort of first class, business class, economy class model where you've still got the countries with the large open financial services sectors making most of the regulation and, and people in business class kind of watching the activities and, and people in economy class receiving, you know, sort of distant reports yeah. of what's going on in Basel. We need those stakes at the table. That's, that's a great point. Your previous point, too, I think is well taken about silo busting and, and thinking about who's doing the trade agreements, what does it mean for the financial sector. On that note, I actually want to bring in the issue of tax policy because that tends to be in a silo sometimes. And it's, it's actually very germane to this debate. Mar uh, Margaret, you're nodding about this. Do you well, want to? Well, you know, I think one of the things we tend to forget, because you know, 2008 is kind of a long time ago now, is that there was an opportunity in the middle of this crisis. There was an opportunity to rethink a lot of things. And to Nairi's point, there was an opportunity to start thinking about the financial system as the whole system, rather than everybody's individual pieces of it. And I think we really flunked that. I think there was a moment we could have been rethinking how different nationalities, different tax structures, different financial structures could collaborate effectively and instead it kind of all, you know, it was, there was a sort of brief shining moment of cooperation and then it all kind of fell apart into let's go back and compete on tax, let's go back and compete on market size, let's go back and compete on regulation. And it really has failed the moment. And I think, you know, what Nairi's saying and much of the work that she's doing is trying very hard to kind of resuscitate that sense that if we want a really secure financial system we have to build that together, not separately. Mm. You know, this is not an argument that's going to be won by everybody <laughs> building their own little financial industry and then seeing which one is the last one left standing. Mm. But that's kind of where we are right now. Mm. Commissioner, do you want to add anything to that? 
Um, we've got about 20 minutes left, so I think I'm going to open the floor up now to questions. There's a couple of folks, runners, with, um, with mics. So we've got one question up here in the front already. If somebody can bring a mic up here um, and just introduce yourself and brief question so we can get as many in as possible. Hi, good morning. Mayra Rodriguez of MRV Associates. You talk about having simple bank regulations. Is that really possible given that a lot of the regulations involve math? And as soon as you have math, Volcker rule, <laughs> uh, leverage ratio, right? Lots of different, it's, you have math. So that has complexity and it makes it difficult for the banks to implement the rules and it makes it incredibly difficult for the bank supervisors to actually monitor these rules. So how do we get this simple regulation? Kara, do you want to take that? Um, it's aspirational, isn't it? I mean, I think we, even with the Volcker, the metrics are going to be really important and that they're transparent and clear. And actually, you can check math. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, uh, there can be clarity in math when there can be less clarity in words. So I'm not, you know, th that being said, uh, I, I still do believe when we can, we should be keeping it uh, simple. And I think it's uh, better uh, both for the regulators and for the industry. So, you know, I, I think there's no silver bullet here, but at the end of the day, uh, I think when we can, we need to be keeping it simple. Question behind. Oh, sorry, go ahead, do you want to well, do no, So what I had in mind when I, when I talked about simple rather than complex, I don't think that Basel I was perfect at all as a set of international standards, but at least by creating three simple buckets and, and measuring what was in those buckets, it gave regulators some chance, perhaps. If you look at the shift to Basel II, and which has a denominator which regulators really a very ill place to understand how, of, how individual firms are risk weighting their assets. And then a numerator over which everybody argues. This, this takes you into a complex regulation which was argued for on the basis that it, that it was more profitable for financial institutions to be able to risk weight their assets. It would give them more possibilities for leverage, which of course is one of the great problems that we ran into. So in my head, the simple versus complex, again, Basel I was not perfect, <laughs> and, um, but it's, it's just a highlight that there are these gradations of simple versus complex. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to understand the rule. But, but the test to me is, can a regulator of the kind that we are able to employ at the salaries that we employ with the resources that we give them can that regulator reasonably apply the rule to the several hundred institutions to which they have to apply it? And if it can't pass that test, we have to rethink what we're doing. Mm. Well, compensation is another issue, too. We might take a page out of the Singaporean book there. Um, question here. Thanks, Robin. Um, speaking of compensation, so you now... <laughs> have... <laughs> so I'm Dan Alpert. I'm a fellow at the Century Foundation and Westwood Capital's managing partner. Um, you have a system of compensation in financial institutions that, based on stock prices, rewards taking uh, current risk in exchange for long-term potential problems. Uh, it actually uh, creates uh, participation by the compensated individual in relative multiple comparisons. Basically, I like your stock, I don't like their stock, and so if you have a way of boosting the, the image of your company, as opposed to the operating side. And then finally, it actually allows you to participate in multiple creep or multiple declines based on market activity that has to do more with macroeconomic policy than it does with the actual operation of your bank. So now, now you, you, you take that to the next consideration and you say, well, what about the, the, the inherent regulatory aspect of shareholders, right? They are supposed to actually be that intermediary to step in, it is after all their capital, to step in and say, okay, what you're doing in terms of executive compensation, in terms of the incentives that you're granting to management, uh, is, is not something that makes great, great sense here because it puts our capital at risk. On the other hand, 
you have investment decisions being increasingly concentrated, I would say completely dominated at this point by large institutional money management firms, none of whom can really afford to suddenly decide, I don't want to own JP Morgan, I don't want to own Goldman Sachs, because by withdrawing their participation in the market to that extent, they're effectively potentially allowing their competitors, other money managers, uh, to do better or worse. And so the, the, the problem is, or the question is, what is the proper role of regulators in the current climate, in the current situation, not something that, that occurred 25 years ago, in actually, I don't want to use the word nannying, but supplanting this loss of governance, loss of, of shareholder control mm -hmm. over executive compensation and other factors to do with the operation of financial institutions? Great, great question and analysis of the problem, I think. Who wants to take a stab at that? <laughs> Commissioner, I'm going to put you I'm on the I'm happy hot, to hot talk seat. about it. I mean, the commission was set up in 1934 to basically oversee a disclosure regime. So probably since the you know, mid-30s, we've maybe even going back to the early 40s, we've had tables that we set up that would show you what executive compensation was. We actually promulgated a rule last week that would uh, put into one table uh, executive uh, salaries for the past five years and compare it to financial performance of the company for the past five years. So we continue to rethink how to inform shareholders of information that is usable that they might be able to act upon and ultimately will probably compare you know, across companies. Um, that's our role, you know, as dictated um, by our own uh, statute. Um, I think, but again, I'm going to go back to, I think we all uh, need to be constantly rethinking the regulatory paradigm. And as the world changed so much, uh, that things need to change. But as we currently oversee um, some, you know, issuers and sort of what's happening in the issuer community, we are basically providing as and requiring as clear information as possible so investors can make decisions about how they'll deploy their capital mm. you know, going forward. Go ahead. No, I think, so the British approach has been to push for deferred compensation with even the possibility of clawback. What sort of interests me and goes to the theme of what I said in opening about the kind of weakness of the regulatory process is that there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that if you are going to defer, you need to defer by 10 to 15 years. But actually what you've ended up with in regimes is five to seven years deferral, just like with capital standards, right? If you ask mm -hmm. the central bank governors of the world what capital standard they would really feel comfortable with, it would be double what <laughs> they've agreed at Basel. So there's this constant sort of regulatory dilution which comes from a, a series of compromises made through the process. And I think there is a little bit of willful blindness in these, in these compromises, which is um, not facing up to the magnitude of the risk that we saw in 2008. Margaret, I want to draw you out on this too, because I think what Dan's describing is actually what you were saying earlier, this kind of crisis of shareholder capitalism itself. I mean, right. how do you, when everybody's in the game together, how do yeah. you break those links? So I think what's really interesting is, you know, when you start to unpack this, there are all sorts of assumptions being made uh, that aren't being checked, right? Mm -hmm. So one is that, you know, you absolutely are legally obliged to, um, for, you know, maximize shareholder value, and that's it. That's your job. Well, the law doesn't say quite that. It's much more subtle. Uh, there are lots of different shareholders who have lots of very different interests. So which shareholders are you talking about? But there's another assumption in this, which is that performance-related pay is going to make people do a better job. Right? This is not substantiated by the research. It just isn't. We tend to think, oh, if you pay more, people will work harder. It, there's just, I can't find the proof. I can find proof that it'll, you know, it'll make people run a little bit harder for about 15 minutes. <laughs> but I can't find the proof that long-term, over time, it really delivers better work from more qualified people. But this has been a truism in all you know, capitalist societies for a very long time. And it's about time we started questioning some of these shibboleths because 
I would say that not only does performance-related pain not deliver superior results, I would say it almost guarantees inferior results because it encourages, incentivizes, really some very perverse decision-making. Mm. So I'm looking for a little bit of a kind of creative and courageous thinking about why are we even beginning to think that this is the right way to pay people. Have you seen an institution that is doing that kind of thinking? I mean, is there a model that you would Not in make? financial institutions, yeah. in other kinds of businesses yeah. I've seen it. Um, you know, and I would say that some of the most innovative businesses in the world, which I write about because it's so much more cheerful than this, um, <laughs> Um, the most innovative businesses in the world tend to be employee-owned, and the only way anybody in those companies do better is if the entire company does better over the long haul. Not just a few shares, but you're talking about cooperative type situations. Yeah, so whether you're talking about Ocean Spray mm. or whether you're talking about probably the world's best engineering firm, which is Arab, mm. right? So this is a very different... Um, kind of organism which prioritizes the social capital implicit in the business mm. as having at least equal, if not more, weight than the financial capital mm. in the business. And I would argue that that's why their innovation is so sustainable. It's why they have such outstanding reputations for incorruptibility. Mm. And it's why, increasingly, really smart young people are gravitating to those kinds of firms. That's interesting. Because they have demonstrable structural social value. Just as a, as a footnote on that, there is um, emerging strong evidence in the public sector that, bonus, uh, that um, performance related pay and bonus pay in teaching and policing, for example, produces perverse results. Yeah. So it crowds out in yeah. the intrinsic motivations for people to do those jobs. Right. They might want to be a police officer in order to be respected by the community, in order to be seen to be doing the right thing, in order to be doing the right thing. You start giving them a publicly declared bonus, right. and first it means their, their own society starts looking at them and going, oh, I know why you're arresting people, it's so you can get your yeah. bonus. Exactly. So it actually starts undercutting the reason they've gone into that work. Same thing in the teaching profession. So maybe there is a crossover into and banking. It's, it's quite interesting because part of what the kind of new managerialism has tried to do is say, well, we want to keep people on the right track, so we're going to give them a target. Uh, but the pro problem is that they focus so much on that target that they're completely oblivious to the havoc they may create in order to reach it. Mm. And I think we've seen that you know, extensively in yeah. financial institutions. That's so I think, you know, and I would also say and urge people to look at the vast psychological data that shows that thinking about money crowds out social mm. connectedness. Mm. You know, there's buckets of this stuff in every country you care to name, <laughs> and we have to start taking it seriously because the people making decisions about finance are human. We may not think of them that way, but they really are. Okay. There was a question back here, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Professor Richard Werner from Southampton University, Professor of Banking. Um, thanks very much for all the comments, particularly Professor Wood's suggestion to have simple regulations, design the institutions properly, and be transparent. Um, but it does presuppose we understand what banks are doing. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a debate about the fundamental basic job of banks, mm -hmm. bank lending, and it's only very recently been settled through empirical work I've done and also Bank of England study that when banks do what we call lending, they don't actually lend existing money, they create new money and add to the money supply. And that of course changes the picture because when banks create money through lending, and this is used for um, asset financial transactions, this must push up asset prices and it's unsustainable in aggregate because there's no creation of income streams, there's only p capital gains. It only works while you keep playing the game and banks continue to lend in asset markets. So the question Whereas if you lend for productive purposes, then you get stable growth, the boring banking. So the question is, do you think, this is actually for all three panelists, we should um, do more work on understanding this fundamental function of banks? Because of course, the simple regulations need to be based on this, and I entirely agree, they can be very simple. Simply ban banks from lending 
for speculative purposes because it's not contributing to society. It's very costly. Okay, um, I'm going to cut you off so that we can make sure to get others to. Nairi, do you want to? So as you were speaking, I was thinking about the parent who sort of leans out the window and yells to their children, I don't know what you're doing out there, but stop it. Right? <laughs> 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 no. This won't do as a regulatory framework, even though it might be tempting to imagine this, you know, because the prospect of and riskiness of shadow banking was mentioned by Janet Yellen. It's been mentioned in this panel. Um, you know, it's a very real prospect, but we can't simply yell to the financial services sector, we don't know what you're doing, but stop it. So, so the place for me is it's the, it's the CEOs and boards of those banks that need 100% to understand exactly what they're doing and to be able to explain that to regulators. And if they can't, we have a problem. And I, I think if we got that far, we'd actually be getting quite a long way. We have time for maybe two more questions. Um, lady in the red jacket back there. There's a subtext in this, I can just take it. Uh, there's a subtext in this conversation. We need to be thinking of solutions that are sort of more radical in terms of you know, pay, governance, you know, a whole set of issues. And yet it seems that we're a bit sanctimonious about talking about certain basic elements of the problem. That, you know, for instance, that um, we have an overgrown financial sector, um, that there's a perception that it's essential for growth, when in fact there's a lot of evidence that says that overly high household debt is negatively correlated with growth. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, re and you know, certainly the work of Andrew, Andrew Haldane points out that the cost of financial crises is so high and that there's, the financial sector can't begin to pay for their cost, that therefore the solution should be much more prohibition. And prohibition is simple regulation. So how do we change, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the dialogue to say that we really need much more radical solutions than yeah. is on the table. You know, for example, the, the, the assumption that innovation is always is good yeah. in financial services, when Paul, at least Paul Volcker has been willing to say he doesn't think any innovation since the ATM was really worthwhile. Okay, this is a, a, a great point. Who wants to tackle that first? Nairi, maybe you. Do we so, need to get much more yeah, radical than we've been no, in the I last think your point is now? really important. And as you were speaking, what, what I was thinking about was we've seen some, I don't know if it's advertent or inadvertent, but political sl sleight of hand in, in the handling of the consequences of the crisis. So that ideally, finance ministers would have come out of their blocks and said, we now need to tax all of you a whole lot more because we have to repair the financial system and recover from this crisis. So every one of you citizens, every one of you firms, we're gonna tax you a whole lot more because we're gonna have to spend a whole lot more. And instead of doing that, the politicians stayed right behind their hedges and instead forced out their central banks and their central bank governors to use quantitative easing both for financial repair and also, as Janet Yellen mentioned, to try to stimulate the economy. It's a very inefficient way to stimulate the economy. So to me, that's the, that's the politics of it. And, uh, and in, in, a, in my ideal, the finance ministers, the governments, the elected officials, would have been forced out to say, this is what's happened and all of you have to pay for it. It would have been a more honest reckoning. I think that this is a, actually, I'd love to get responses from both of you to this point. Well, I, I mean, I, I think you're right because I think that, you know, in some ways, so we're here to talk about finance and society, what's happened to the financial sector and the way that it runs itself is the way that we run really all of our society, which is we have clearly been very comfortable with the notion that we're going to make everybody everywhere compete, right? From kindergarten to business school to banks. And we are going to be completely comfortable with the notion that that system is destined and designed to produce a couple of big, big, big winners and a lot of losers. And all of the structures that we have built confirm and enhance and increase that fundamental mindset. And if we're going to get out of that, and if we're uncomfortable with what it's produced, we have to be willing to question all of the assumptions implicit in it. We have to start thinking about what is the financial sector that does maximum good for a very large number of people, 
not just a few people? Mm. What are the kinds of educational and industrial models that we want to create, and what are the management systems that we want to create that are about elevating and enhancing a lot of talent from everyone, not just going through life picking out the superstars. Mm. This is a fundamental mindset shift, because if we want to think about why we are left with such grotesque levels of inequality, we have to think back to a system which is always been in my lifetime about picking winners, whether picking winning stocks, picking winning people, picking winning industries. And we have to start thinking about a far more broad-based idea of social success. Okay. Um, Commissioner, do you have anything you want to say on this point? And then we're going to take the last question. Yeah, I, I, I think I think of the financial or finance system as, as in many ways like the circulatory system. Sometimes I compare it to our federal highway system, mm -hmm. and it's a public good, and that lot of commerce happens um, you know, on it, and we need to make sure the roads are safe, that uh, we know what type of cars and trucks are allowed to go on them, you know, and they have minimum safety standards. Uh, we might have safety belts and airbags, <laughs> speed limits, you know, lights, but we need to think through, I think, as the government, what those basic rules of the road uh, need to be with underlying issue as you know, safety and, and making sure it works for everyone. Mm -hmm. So I think when I think about it, sometimes you can go, is it fair? But you get back to basic principles. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to keep making sure this public good mm -hmm. maintains its health and doesn't harm us. OK, it last question us. here in the middle. My question was, uh, instead of regulating, like instead of imposing tight regulation on financial system to make sure that, for example, we restore their incentive to act more ethically, don't you think that, don't, don't you think uh, if we, for example, change the tax code so that if someone got really rich, there are more portion of his income goes to so other social causes, for example, to improve the society, that would be a much better solution instead of trying to change the incentives. So we talked a little bit about tax code. Uh, uh, Margaret, do you want to say anything final well, on that? I mean, certainly it used to be, for example, in the 1970s mm -hmm. in this country that, that you know, the tax rates were very, very much higher with the result that we had lower levels of inequality. I think the problem now in a globalized world is mm -hmm. the minute you do that in one place, some other um, country jumps up and says, oh, bring your money here, we won't tax you, or we won't tax you very much. And I think in a global economy, that just becomes you know, just impossible to solve. Mm. I think you know, it's a conversation we are having earlier, uh, and you know, if you want ambitious ideas, here's one. I think we seriously have to reposition tax. Yeah. What it is, what it's for, that it's a privilege, that it's how we get a civilized place to live. And I think, you know, I think that's a really tough, job. But I think having sat at more tables than I like to remember with everybody exchanging their tax tips and how to <laughs> minimize you know, their, their uh, tax liability and thinking that that was a badge of honor, yeah. look, I have so much money, I need to find ways to hide it. I think we have a really serious social repositioning to do about what makes society function. OK. Nairi, last word I just you. wanted to end on an optimistic note on that, because I, I think that um, the tide is slightly changing, certainly in Britain and in Europe on tax. You know, the G8 have come out, and, and the British government under Prime Minister David Cameron have come out with quite robust statements about the need to, for, for CEOs, for citizens to actually pay their tax. I mean, it's a pretty simple proposition. But we've got to a point where Amazon, Starbucks, Google, etc., were all saying, you know, don't blame us for not paying a penny of tax in Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, we've found loopholes in the law which we're legally entitled to, to use. Instead of a statement which says, yeah, we're citizens, we know we have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and I, I just sense that there is a slight change happening. I see it in some large companies in Britain <coughs> that do pay tax that have investigated the possibilities of shifting headquarters and shifting operations so as to minimize tax and are actually deciding on balance to stay and to pay tax. Mm. So 
maybe we're seeing a change. All right, well, I'm glad to stop on an optimistic note and one that kind of knits together finance with the real economy. Thank you all, great discussion, really wide ranging.